Looking like airplanes just off the assembly line, both these Grumman F-11A fighters are pushing two decades of service. And these were no hangar queens. At one time, one of these F-11s was number two in the famous Blue Angel Diamond Formation. The other Tiger did a demanding stint as lead Blue Angel solo with all the stresses and strains that imposed. Yet here they are, back in harness again, flying from Grumman's Calverton Flight Test Facility in a new test program. The occasion for reactivating the two F-11s was to flight test a Roar Industries developed in-flight thrust reverser designed to provide in-flight thrust control and in this day of initials shortened to IFTC. This flight test phase is the culmination of a five-year development program and would make the first time that practical in-flight evaluations could be performed on a thrust reversing device as a potential air combat maneuvering device for future aircraft. The two aircraft were restored to mint condition at the Navy Grumman Flight Test Facility at Calverton on Long Island, New York. One, the upper aircraft was restored to its original configuration and provided baseline measurements for a side-by-side -side comparison. The lower aircraft became a true test bed for in addition to the installation of the in-flight thrust control system, the aircraft was fully instrumented. Some 60 parameters could be measured and recorded on the onboard tape recorder. The critical parameters were also relayed by telemetry to the ground station. Other aircraft changes included the disabling of the speed brakes and the removal of some unnecessary avionics. Salvaged from the scrap heap to become test beds for research and development work, both aircraft arrived in October 1972 at the Navy Grumman facility on trailers, not really looking like Tigers. Yet by February 1973, Grumman's chief test pilot, Chuck Sewell, was able to take number one up for a functional check and airspeed calibration pacing. His comments, only a few minor discrepancies. A remarkable situation for an airplane that had not flown in more than four years. This attests not only to the ease of maintenance of this relatively simple design, but also to its skillful reassembly and inspection. Basically, the in-flight thrust control operates by blocking engine thrust from the tailpipe and diverting it forward through deflector doors. In this way, 100% of forward thrust component is transformed into a 48% reverse thrust component. The three blocker doors, having their centers 120 degrees apart in a barrel after the engine, are actuated by a thrust modulating lever in the cockpit. They are variable from 0% to 100% of barrel closure. The three deflector doors have two positions, fared or fully open. Theirs is the first action in the sequence, and they snap fully open before the blocker doors begin their actuation. The thrust modulating lever located just inboard the throttle quadrant is in a forward detent when the blocker doors are in the retracted or stowed position. Coming out of detent, the following things happen. If afterburner has been selected, bringing the thrust modulating lever out of detent automatically brings the engine out of afterburner. This is the only time the thrust modulating lever has an effect on the engine. Bringing the lever out of detent also fully opens the deflector doors. This must happen before the blocker doors can move. As the lever is moved aft, 
the blocker doors converge and thrust is deflected. Moving the lever as rapidly as possible will produce a slam deployment in two seconds. The percentage of blocker door closing is run on a gauge on the pilot's center panel. A fail-safe system senses any discrepancies in the system operation and automatically stows the blocker doors. A manual override system is also available to the pilot. A switch on the left-hand console will immediately stow the blocker doors. A button on the stick does the same thing. If the blocker doors are commanded to the stowed position, either by fail-safe or by pilot manual override, the system is readily restored to normal operation in flight by simply cycling the thrust modulating lever into the detent. A set of eight switches enables the pilot to pre-flight check the fail-safe system by sending various asymmetrical error signals to the comparator logic system. One more fail-safe item. Since the system is electro-hydraulically activated, should there be a hydraulic failure, the blocker doors move to a neutral aerodynamic position, permitting over 4,200 pounds of forward thrust mill power adequate for level flight and landing. Prior to first flight, a flight readiness review was held. The Tiger was ready for its debut as an in-flight thrust control test vehicle. For those who may have forgotten, a few vital F-11 statistics. The baseline aircraft has a wingspan of 31 feet and a max gross takeoff weight of 24,000 pounds. The F-11s are powered by a Wright J65W18 engine producing approximately 7,500 pounds of thrust. The thrust reversing system was designed to permit its use throughout the full F-11A flight envelope. A dozen flights were made by Grumman to establish a safe flight envelope for the operation of in-flight thrust control. Structural integrity, stability, propulsion and temperatures were examined. IFTC deployments to 100% blockage have been made across a broad spectrum of speed, altitude, throttle settings, and during a variety of maneuvers. Many of the newest testing techniques used for the F-14 fighter were applied to this F-11 program. Test requirements were integrated into test blocks so that several technical disciplines obtained data from each maneuver performed. In-flight refueling was used to extend the duration of test flights. Also, the automated telemetry system was used to permit several test engineers to observe the process test results in real time and advise the pilot of the results. Without these techniques, the same test program would have required three to four times the dozen flights actually flown. Some highlights. In one test maneuver, the F-11A was able to maintain a constant airspeed in a 60-degree dive with a rate of descent of 25,000 feet per minute by using reverse thrust. Another flight marked another first. The first deployment of reverse thrust at supersonic speed at 1.18 indicated Mach number. A glide slope control evaluation showed some extra pilot workload due to trim changes but also showed that in a wave-off situation, full mill power was available right now. The blocker doors stow in about a second compared to some four to five seconds it takes to wind up the engine to full mill power from normal approach settings. One of the interesting things about in-flight thrust control is that until about 75% of blockage is achieved, the modified aircraft reacted very similarly to the baseline aircraft with the speed brakes out. Also, between 65 and 75 percent of blockage at high Q, only moderate pitch trim changes were required. Above 75 percent blockage, again at the upper Q range, the same amount of trim changes as required with the speed brakes were observed.
However, there was a dramatically higher rate of deceleration. At low Q, it was about the same story. Using IFTC required little more trim change than the baseline aircraft using speed brakes. All trim changes were limited to pitch axis only. No yaw or roll trim changes were required at any queue. It had been predicted that pitch trim requirements in the power approach configuration would exceed stabilizer authority to hold the nose up with 100% thrust blockage. It didn't work out that way at all. The pilot had sufficient stabilizer authority and no difficulty with attitude control. Before someone asks, here is a word or two about Buffett. As the aircraft approaches aerodynamic stall in the power approach configuration, there is some Buffett. Its amplitude dependent on the amount of blockage above 75%. And like the baseline aircraft, Buffett does not increase noticeably as a stall becomes imminent. Some of this small amount of increased buffeting seems to be generated by flow field interaction of the deflected thrust on the stabilizers. Landing rollout is dramatically shortened by use of in-flight thrust control. Touchdown at about 142 knots with 1,000 to 1,500 pounds of fuel, deploy the blocker doors and rollout is shortened to about 2,700 feet, less than half of what it would be without using in-flight thrust control. There has been time for just a quick look at ACM so far with the in-flight thrust control. But when the modified airplane was using IFTC and pulling three Gs, there was no way that the baseline airplane could stay behind him. A far superior drag device than speed brakes, the IFTC, fully deployed, provides 3,600 pounds of reverse thrust. The establishment by Grumman of a safe flight envelope completed the first phase of the flight programs. The airplanes have now been transferred to the Naval Air Test Center at Patuxent River, Maryland. It is here the Navy will begin a scheduled program of tactical evaluation. Air-to-ground weapons delivery is one item to be studied. With IFTC, the airplane will roll into a steeper than normal dive, maintain a more constant airspeed, spend less time in the dive, and use a smaller lead angle, all of which should improve accuracy. The enhanced air combat maneuvering qualities will also be studied, pitting the baseline aircraft against the IFTC modified aircraft. It has been an interesting beginning to an interesting program. The Rohr industry's design has been verified. Both Grumman and Rohr have obtained valuable experience and test data that will be applicable to future design. And for the first time, the Navy has a test vehicle that will enable a thorough examination of the potential of in-flight thrust control. Thank you.